I'm really pleased uh, tonight that uh, Mayor Kasim Reed from Atlanta has joined us. He made a special trip uh, to come up here. And uh, as you can imagine, being the mayor of a city like Atlanta, he doesn't have a lot of spare time. So I, I think we're really, we really appreciate your coming here. Uh, uh, Kasim Reed. Thank you. That's pretty good. You get applause and haven't even said anything yet. I love it when it works out. <laughs> Uh, Kasim Reed is 48 years old. He's been the mayor of Atlanta since 2010. He's term limited, so he can't run again. So I told him that meant he had to be candid tonight, but he said he would have been candid even if he were running for re-election. Uh, uh, Kasim Reed was actually born in New Jersey. Uh, does that make you a constituent of Chris Christie somehow? It does not. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> he, he grew up in Atlanta. Uh, he was a rather entrepreneurial young man. He made $40,000 running a jewelry business that he started at age 18. He went to Howard University here in Washington, D.C., where he made money selling boxer shorts with the Howard emblem. He graduated from Howard in 1991 from its law school in 1995, and he's still a trustee of that a great university. Uh, mayor Reed spent over a decade in the Georgia State Legislature before running for mayor. He won with the overwhelming margin of 714 votes out of 84,000 cast mm -hmm. in 2009. Um, he found, he inherited a city that was basically broke. It had about $7 million in reserves, less than 2% of the general fund. It had tens of millions of dollars in unpaid bills. And I read, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the city had laid off so many firefighters that there were only three firefighters per truck, which is below the national standard. Mm -hmm. um, he continued to cut the headcount in Atlanta, except for police. He cut a remarkable deal on pensions with the city unions. And by 2010, reserves were up to 14% of revenues. Four years later, he was reelected with 84% of the vote, which in Washington these days we call huge. <laughs> um, I read up a little on the mayor in Atlanta. I read that in a Moody's report that um, they uh, praised him for making the city more appealing both to new businesses and to tourists. Uh, they said that the pension burden remains notable, but significant reforms will lead to more manageable long-term costs. Atlanta's bond rating is AA plus. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, Tom Friedman of the New York Times has singled out Mayor Reed as among the leaders who are developing a hybrid politics that persuades a majority of voters that we need to cut where we must so we can invest where we must. Uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution last month said that Mayor Reed's tenure has been a boon for, e for downtown development. Atlanta's population peaked in 1970, it lost population for 20 years, but it's been growing since the early 90s. As I said, Mayor, Lee, Mayor Reed has term limited, so he can't run again. There's some speculation that he may run for governor of Atlanta or the Senate for some, at some time in the future, the U.S. Senate. But meantime, he's made climate change one of his big issues. He's on the board of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. He has said that where cities, cities are where hope meets the street and where we have the greatest opportunity to make decisive impact that will be unchanged by national policy. Speaking about climate change, but these days about a number of other things. So um, we have some time here. I'm going to talk to the mayor for a while, and then our, some of my colleagues here from Brookings are going to bring around a mic, and you can ask questions. Uh, mayor Reed, I'd like to start from when you, become, you became mayor. You just been through this wrenching financial crisis. You become mayor and discovered that the city's basically bust. Yeah. Um, uh, and one of the things you did was to take on an issue that's a big issue for many municipalities and state governments is the pensions. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that evolved. How did you bring the labor unions along? How, how, what, what lessons do you think you learned that others can benefit from? Um, well, it really was easy, David. O on the first, yeah, you right. know, you have, no, no, here, here's the deal. So I have this wonderful inauguration. I make the decision that I'm going to take the train to my office. I'm feeling terrific. It's freezing cold. But I get on the train. Nobody's on the train. They're bomb sniffing dogs, and I have all of this security. So they don't let people on the train with me. <laughs> we take the train a few stops. It's me and my family. We get off. We walk. 
And I walked into my office, which was built for Ambassador Andrew Young. It's a beautiful office. And so at the end of my ceremony, the first thing I did was sit down, and a group of, of lawyers uh, and finance folks bought six stacks of documents that were about half a foot high. And so the first thing that I did as mayor, after being sworn in, was to sign a series of tax anticipation notes that if we had not signed them, then the payroll would have bounced. And so that wouldn't have been a good start for me. So I signed these tax anticipation notes, and this is the terrific part. The security disappeared. <laughs> and so all of this security that I thought was for me was for my signature to get to that office and sign <laughs> those tax anticipation notes. It was one of the best things that happened to me because uh, when those folks left me in that office, I had campaigned on pension reform. Uh, we were spending 18% of all cash coming in the door uh, on what was basically a subprime loan. We had an open amortization on our pension. So we were writing a check for $110 million and none of it was going to actually pay off the debt or move the needle. But that moment in my office made me decide I'm actually going to do something about it. And it's not going to be in a year or two years or three years. It's going to be right now. And so that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And I made this decision. I, 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 there's this book called Instruct Instruction to Deliver by Michael Barber. If you love cities, you should read it. But his theory is, is that um, if you don't get the fundamentals right in government, people won't believe you for the aspirational aspects of government. So basically, if, if I'm getting hit over the head at my car, don't come to me talking about a program for kids. If there are potholes in my streets, don't come to me talking about money for green space. So it caused me to focus um, on a really deliberate way about getting the finances of the city in order. And today, they're in the best shape that they've been in uh, in 40 years. So how did you get the union to go along with your pension plan and describe the They realized plan. that I was crazy. So, <laughs> so, so here's where Donald Trump got the idea. Yeah, right? so, so here's what happened. Uh, I only won by 714 votes. I wanted to be mayor since I was 13. And so my friends uh, who helped make me mayor came into my office and they said, if you put a pension bill on the floor, we're going to go get us another mayor. I'll remember it like it was yesterday. And so that hurt my feelings. <laughs> um, and then, uh, quick story, I get a phone call uh, from Mayor Daly. And so among mayors, there was Mayor Daly and Mayor Bloomberg. So if, if those two people were in the room, the room would rock back and forth between those two people. And so I call my assistant who had been with me for 15 years. I say, Lily, she, call, she says, there's Mayor Daly at you on the phone. I said, that's wonderful. I sit in my chair the way that you do when you take an important call. I put both feet on the ground, made sure that I was a good voice. And I said, Lily, send the call. And Lily sent the call in. I picked up the telephone. And he said, Kashi? <laughs> I said, it's Kasim. He said, whatever. <laughs> And he said, uh, he said, I tell you what, he said, he said, boy, you must really like practicing law. I said, uh, no, sir, I, the mayor of Atlanta is a full-time job. He said, well, I tell you what, you keep messing with those people's pensions, you're going to be back to practicing law. <laughs> and then he hung up the phone, and he must have an old phone because it was like, hangla, hangla. And so I sat there in that room, and, uh, and I decided uh, that I was going to do it with what I had to do. Because the judgment that I made was is if Atlanta was as broke as it was when I walked into the door, seeing that I'd only won by 714 votes, I wouldn't win anyway. So I might as well go ahead and get to it. <laughs> then I called a group of CEOs together because we had to raise about three million bucks to fund the analysis, both legal and financial, to pay for it. And I wanted a third party to do it so that nobody would argue about the data. And so we formed a blue ribbon panel, and the results were so terrible that the business community would not allow us to make a recommendation. So what the panel did was to identify six paths, and then they presented them and let me pick the path, David. And so it was a series of nine changes that we made uh, in the pension. Of course, we, uh, we uh, increased uh, the vesting period of course, we had a hybrid related to 
a 401k like product, of course, we significantly uh, reduced the access to those benefits and cleaned our roles to make sure that people that we should, we did all of those things and we got a deal 15-0 from the Atlantic City Council. And when you ask how we did it, the one of those six plans was far more aggressive than the one that I ultimately did. And so what I said was, is that if you all make me get to 10 votes on my own, because we required a two thirds majority, and so I got to seven, and I got to eight, and I got to nine, and that monster plan was over there on that wall. And when I got to nine, we did a deal on the plan that's in place today and got a 15-0 unanimous vote. At, on that day, we were 50% funded. Today, we're about 81, 82% funded. Uh, on that day, we closed the amortization, and our pension costs have gone to about, from about 18 and a half to about 14 and a half today. We saved 270 million in cash over a 10 year period of time. We will save 500 million over a 30 year period of time. And so it became a, a joy to come to work because people could now come to the city and work on other things aside from laying people off and having furloughs. So let's talk a little about infrastructure investment, which is, there's a lot of debate about these days. Um, of course, private investors have a lot of money that they say mm -hmm. they want to lend and P3s and all that, but of course, um, they want to get paid back. Now, in many communities, getting a tax increase to finance infrastructure is a great idea, but never gets, no one proposes it because they're afraid if they do, it'll either get knocked down in a referendum or the person who proposes it will get defeated. Mm -hmm. Last November, you got approval for two sales and in tax increases. Uh, half a percentage point for MARTA and another four tenths for other for the Beltline and other infrastructure projects. You have that means you now have an 8.9 percent sales tax mm -hmm. in Atlanta. So how did you convince people that they would? That's a pretty big bill you're asking them to pay. How, what was the political equation that you worked to get people to support such a big tax increase? That we had delivered concrete results on the other three ballot measures. So that was my fifth ballot measure in seven years. We did one for our water and sewer sales tax. We funded a four to six billion dollar program with 120 million in revenue off that 1%. Sales tax is the opportunity for cities to benefit from the tripling of the size of the city every day. So during it, during Atlanta's a city of half a million, during the day it's about 1.3, 1.5. So we provide the water for the city of Atlanta. So on the 1%, I made the argument that let some other folks help us along. And then I put, uh, I put to voters a Renew Atlanta bond because we had a $900 million infrastructure backlog. And once it got to about a billion and a half, then we would have been in a, another crisis position. And then I put the expansion of MARTA, which is the largest expansion of our rail system uh, in 40 years and another infrastructure bond because I wanna uh, cut our infrastructure backlog in half. The way we did it is to get out and make the case and fight the fight and have the discussions and the conversations and to understand that political capital is not to, is not to be placed on a shelf. Folks elect you to get out here and win for them and once you can make the case, keep making it. When we did pension reforms, I did 40 meetings I met with 4,800 employees, many of whom who were very angry at me and thought that I was trying to do something bad to them. The turning point in that conversation was when a 64-year-old woman got up and confronted me in a room like the one we're in uh, tonight, although far less nice. <laughs> and all I said was, I said, you know what? I know you're upset with me, but right now you're walking around with a bad check. And you can be tough with me, but what will happen if I'm not successful is somebody after me, some fiscal conservative, is going to come in and they're going to declare bankruptcy. And you're going to get pennies on the dollar. So you might think that I'm hard-hearted, but all I'm trying to do is to make sure you get 100% on the dollar on your pension. That was the turning point in that pension conversation. Similarly, what people want right now is to get out in the midst of them and fight the fights that need to be fought. And when you disagree, I'm the mayor. 
I am the mayor until the last minute of the last day of the last hour and beat me, which I frequently say. There are 15 votes on Atlanta City Council. In Atlanta, you need eight votes in my signature to implement policy. During the seven years I have been mayor, we have never lost a vote on a legislative item. And I think that, I think that you know, it's like Michael Jordan. I'm going to go right until somebody can stop me. <laughs> right? So until somebody stops you, I think that we need to be out here. That's why cities are where all the fun are. I was talking to uh, Mark Funkhauser in the back, who was another mayor. He's somewhere in the audience. Um, cities are where the action is. Nothing's getting done. Nobody comes here except to have a nice meal and see friends. <laughs> cities are where the action is. You're moving to a time in America and around the world where mayors are like ministers. The number of CEOs that I interact with on a direct basis because of the cooperative relationship that I have with our governor is game changing. So when G Digital, uh, we in the last uh, 48 months, we've located 18 regional or North American headquarters in the city of Atlanta. Mercedes Benz is in Sandy Springs outside of the city. Porsche Cars North America, the biggest investment by Porsche outside of Germany is on the campus of my airport. Uh, Pulte Homes is the second biggest home builder, moved their headquarters from Michigan. So competition after competition, uh, I think that we're winning in the Southeast. And I shared at our table here that my mission when I wake up is really simple. From the eastern border of Texas to the Atlantic Ocean, north to Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, my job is to make sure that if you're thinking about coming south, that Atlanta is the center of gravity. And nobody can make a case based upon data that there's an economy that's bigger than ours. We're the ninth biggest economy, 5.8 million people, a regional GDP of $335 billion. Unemployment's been cut in half, double A plus credit, crime down 37%, police force at almost 2,000, fire department, four people on a truck, insurance credit, insurance rating, ISO number one, and more cash in the bank than we've had in 40 years. So that's my elevator pitch. That's pretty good. <laughs> Beat it. You know? <laughs> so, uh, what? You, you will leave a city that's in much better financial state, and indeed the national economy is in better yeah. financial state, state when you took over. What, what do you think should be the priorities of your successor, whoever she may be? Um, she shouldn't blow the budget. There is, an ener there is energy within City Hall to spend when times feel like they're good. But something bad in cities is always around the corner. And so my successor will have had eight years with no tax increases, no water rate increases, 200 million in cash, we're 175 million today. So they will have a series of tools that if we're in a, in a city that is thriving, employ uh, uh, our population, uh, is up by some 30 to 40,000. So there are all these positive metrics that have to be managed. And in addition to that, we have 10 to $12 billion in capital projects. So we have enough capital projects that if well managed, we have a diverse economy that all you gotta do is not blow it. So and then I think they ought to play bigger than I played uh, as I shared when we were at the table in education. Um, I think that they probably should persuade the governor uh, to take three of the nine member school boards and appoint private citizens to them. You have an elected school board now. We have a, the mayor has very little yeah. control over the school system. We have very little control except for the bully pulpit of the office. I <coughs> think that you really need three private sector individuals who are part of that board who don't get into the fray regarding gamespersonship. But as I told you at the table, when I got elected, we had the worst cheating, scam cheating crisis in America. I had a superintendent that was getting ready to put on trial. I had to call the chancellor of the higher education system for the state of Georgia and ask him to come and be a superintendent. I mean, it's a hard call. I mean, his wife hung up on me several times. <laughs> but we hung in there. Uh, we got him to agree to become our superintendent. It stabilized the system. And so I felt like I had played in that space uh, enough. But I, if I had another term, term in me, uh, I would focus on attracting people who can operate a government really well. And then uh, I would be in New York every month begging Standard & Poor's to give me my AAA. 
Oh. <laughs> uh, that takes me in two directions, so I'll go to the credit rating. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about wh what, what, how do you look at the credit rating and how do you talk to your, your people and your voters about the credit rating? Um, I look at the credit rating uh, as, as a guardrail. I spent 11 years in the Georgia General Assembly and the state of Georgia is one of seven states in America that had AAA credit. So whether you were a Republican or a Democrat when I was growing up, if you did something that put the state's AAA credit rating at risk, you were a pariah and an outcast. So what I'm trying to do is to bring that culture to municipal government so that it will, it will go beyond me. You know, you don't have to be brilliant to understand that the credit rating was double A plus and then it's being downgraded. So I'm trying to institute um, that kind of, of culture. And then when I get out among voters, you got great credits, you get more stuff. The fact of the matter is when we do a bond deal or when we uh, engage in a transaction because folks want to do business with us, uh, all of our offerings are typically vastly oversubscribed. And so a real person is being impacted um, by this, you know, by this rating that used to sit on a book in a shelf somewhere. So I'm trying to change the culture so that it will be challenging for a successor to do something different outside of the rails. And then uh, I'm just trying to deliver uh, more stuff. So how much of a constraint is the credit rating on you doing what you want to do? Uh, it's actually not a constraint on, on me doing what I want to do because it attracts the private sector. Uh, the private sector capital goes where it's needed and stays where it is well cared for. So when the private sector sees a city that had credit that was a couple of levels above junk, moved to double A plus, and that has the kind of other fundamentals, they decide, you know, my capital will be good here. So if you look at where we are right now, Atlanta is in the top 10 cities in America in terms of foreign direct investment, which everybody in this room knows uh, is going to be key, certainly to surviving in the next 5, 10, and 15 years. And it's a signal sender to companies like Mercedes-Benz, like Porsche, like Pulte, like NCR, who's built a $300 million campus in my downtown right now. And so uh, I, don't f I don't feel that it constrains me. <coughs> I feel that it puts me in better company. Hmm, interesting. So uh, there's a, a thoughtful economist now at Stanford, Roz Chetty, who has looked at um, the chances of a kid moving from poverty to the middle mm -hmm. class. And his numbers suggest that it's harder for a kid born in Atlanta, as it is in much of the <coughs> South, to climb that ladder of upward mobility. So um, I hear that you've made uh, uh, you've brought a lot of corporate development to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, you've certainly restored the, the luster of the city. You have these great stadiums, which we'll talk about <laughs> in a minute. You have the Porsche, and, and uh, you've got the Mercedes-Benz thing. But do you feel like you've done enough to make it easier for a kid who was born into poverty in Atlanta to grow up and be in the middle class? Uh, I, I don't ever feel I've done enough in that regard because – when I think about those young people, I think about me. I mean, I was born in New Jersey, but I got to Atlanta when I was one, so I never knew anything else. Um, here's what we've done. I mean, we have launched a series of initiatives that, once again, almost always involve the private sector playing a bigger role than they ever played before because they feel better about the city overall. So when I got elected, two-thirds of all recreation centers in the city of Atlanta, a place that whether we realize it or not, are key institutions to people that don't have the blessings that many of us do. Two thirds of them were closed. And unsurprisingly, almost all of them were closed in the neighborhoods that needed the most. The strong neighborhoods kept theirs open. I opened every single one of them and went to the private sector and raised uh, more than $10 million for that overall effort. And we went from seeing 150 kids a day, six days a week, to 2,000. So to a mom, that means that you know exactly where your kid is until about 7 o'clock at night, seven days a week. We partnered with the Boys and Girls Club and bought a rigorous program involving health, well-being, and technology. And we cut crime among teens by 20 for 25%. So that's a young boy or girl who doesn't go out in the street 
and get a criminal record and take themselves out of the employment game. Because of the success that we had in other areas, we just launched an anti-displacement program because of the level of gentrification that's going on in Atlanta. So we got a group of private sector businesses and philanthropists to identify two neighborhoods because we're starting a pilot, Vine City and English Avenue. We identified everybody who had a mortgage in that community, who owned a home and who was scared that they were going to get kicked out. We raised the money to guarantee those individuals that their tax bill will not change for 20 years. And so that was another important signal. And then we raised money for grant dollars so that those folks could upgrade their homes and retrofit it for energy efficiency so they didn't have the ugly house on the street. So I can give you example after example. We, we walked away from or started a new model around uh, public housing where we built 74 individual homes as opposed to building a large public housing project. We call it a scattered site approach. If you were to go into that neighborhood and see those 74 homes, all of which are, um, have some type of support, it looks like a completely different neighborhood rather than walking up to a building that's a public housing project building. Uh, folks who know the story of Atlanta know that when they celebrated the 50th anniversary of HUD, uh, it was celebrated in Atlanta because of our approach to making sure that people have mixed use housing. And then we've moved from a policy position of 15 to 20% affordability at the school board, the city of Atlanta and Fulton County. And while there is more to do, nobody else who's had my job has done more in 30 years. And so that's the decision that you have to make. Did you do everything that was within your power to do? And in most instances, with the exception of the Atlanta Beltline, I think we've done that. What do you mean the exception? The, the Atlanta Beltline, I don't think we've gotten right. The Atlanta Beltline is like New York's High Line. It's, it's, it's the recla reclaimed 22-mile railway that was featured on the front page of the New York Times. But if you were comparing it to the High Line, the High Line would have to go to Westchester County in New York City. And so the Atlanta Beltline has taken off. It's attracted about $400 million in public investment to reclaim and clean the Beltline and turn it into a series of paths and bike trails that connect 45 neighborhoods, but it's attracted uh, now $3.8 billion in private capital. And so it's absolutely taken off. But what it has done is it's created real pricing pressure uh, in a lot of challenged neighborhoods. And I don't believe that we have done enough uh, to deal with the good part. So if you can imagine a high line in New York and all of the, the ripple effects that it's had in New York, we're experiencing something around uh, like that around the belt line, which is driving the value of our property tax digest. So that's one where uh, I feel like we've fallen short. Hmm. So what keeps you up at night these days? Um, Post-Paris terrorism. Um, the city of Atlanta owns the busiest airport on earth. So we handle 13% of domestic air travel and we have 104 million guests that come through Hartsville-Jackson, whether they want to or not. <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry, I know y'all feel that. <laughs> and so, we, um, we feel your pain, yeah. Yeah, and so, so um, we have the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 businesses in America behind New York and behind Houston, Texas. We've got brands like UPS, CNN, the Coca-Cola company. And, uh, and I think that they are shiny objects in a place that does not have the reputation for being hardened. And so I think post Paris, uh, any mayor worth their salt has to think of terrorism in a way that I never planned on when I was mayor. So I've doubled the size of our SWAT team. I've added a 75 uh, long rifle um, uh, police officers. We've changed the security format uh, in the city of Atlanta, and when my phone rings, that's the first thing that I think about. Um, so that's easily that. Um, regarding uh, what's, what's unexpected, what's unexpected in cities are civic protests. Um, on any given day now, something can happen in another city, and you'll have 15,000 protesters in your city protesting something that happened in Minnesota and Baton Rouge. 
And then I live in a city that's the home of Dr. Martin Luther King. So the way that we handle those protesters uh, has to be especially sensitive. So those two areas are areas that when I was going door to door running to be mayor of Atlanta, uh, I never imagined that I would have to think about them the way that I think about now because the repercussions of both of them are global. So in America now, an adverse story uh, becomes global in about 20 minutes. So if you got 15,000 protesters in your downtown, which we had uh, either last July and or the July before that, we had Fox, CNN, and MSNBC with live cameras covering 15,000 protesters that were moving through our, our downtown. And so the consequences of that um, are pretty striking if you don't handle it well or perceive uh, to be unprepared. So uh, Atlanta had white mayors for about 125 years until we Mayor did. Jackson was mm -hmm. elected was about, what, 30 years ago? 40. 40 years ago? 74. And um, there have been black mayors ever since, but Atlanta's becoming more white, yes. correct? And there's a good chance that your successor will be white. Yes. Do you think that's going to make any difference? Do you think it's going to, how's that going to affect African Americans? In Atlanta, is it a change that we should think of as a milestone, or I is think it that just growing up? I think the campaign's going to be exciting. I think that when I ran for mayor, I said that anybody could have become mayor when I ran for mayor. I think God was listening too closely for that. And, uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, on a going forward before, basis, yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, I think that it's a terrific opportunity, and it shows that Atlanta uh, has come full circle. And I think that the most talented person will become mayor, and I think on a going forward basis, anybody could become mayor. I also think it's going to uh, cause us to give much more attention uh, to our international community. So folks are actually reading it incorrectly. Actually, you have a majority black population, but you've got a, a growing uh, immigrant population and foreign-born population, and I think it's going to force politicians to uh, include them in the conversation in a way that they haven't before. So I look forward to the election. So How to beat everybody that's running me. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we can't test yeah, that, I so know. we have to take your word for it. I know. Uh, I'm going to turn to the audience in a minute, so if the, uh, my colleagues can get ready to the mics. I just want to ask you one final question. Yes. So I notice you've talked a lot about climate change, mm -hmm. and your it seems to be on your agenda of things to do before you run for some other office. Mm -hmm. um, why? And what difference can a mayor make in that? Um, one, because there is no planet B, and mayors are where the center of gravity are. Uh, we're the ones that can take on climate. Uh, I have very strong feelings about the lack of real progress that's being made in Washington. If you look at the leading cities in the world, I'm, uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, pointed me to the Global Compact of Mayors. It's 7,400 mayors that represent 675 million people, so a little less than 10% of the planet. Uh, if cities act, uh, we can still achieve 25 to 35% CO2 reduction. Uh, I think all of us who are serious in the world understand that something is going on with the, the, the weather and the climate. And so um, I think that having a city like Atlanta lead is really important because we're more accessible than New York, San Francisco, or London. So somebody that just wants to do something about climate who's in Nashville or in Cincinnati or in Louisville can look at Atlanta and say, if Atlanta's doing it, what I do, can what do it too. What does that mean in practical terms? What are you doing? Practical terms, we have uh, launched the largest electric vehicle fleet in the history of the city of Atlanta. We have a partnership with one of the leading technology firms uh, in Atlanta to help uh, uh, distribute our trash in a more efficient way. We're launching the largest solar initiative in the entire state of Georgia. We just passed the PACE legislation uh, to help fund our energy retrofits. We're the number one city in America uh, in terms of private sector companies that have committed to reduce their energy use by 20% by the year 2020 as a part of the Better Buildings Challenge. Our private sector uh, office owners uh, have signed up to the tune of, of 111 million square feet, 599 buildings. All of that's being done in the city of Atlanta. And what about the, you said you told me 
to some disclosure rule that you got through? And we passed uh, a local ordinance that says if you own a building that's 25,000 square feet or more, you have to publish uh, the sustainability and energy efficiency results of that building so that someone who's looking for a place uh, to, to move their business has all of the information and the data. And how did the commercial property owners respond? They, didn't, they didn't enjoy that. <laughs> but I think that they enjoyed uh, the 4.9 four billion in new construction and the 2.9 billion in the previous year before that and the records we've set uh, in construction activity. So, you know, it worked out. So what, what is on your to-do list that you made when you were 13 years old that you didn't get to? Oh, man, that's a good question. That's a stinker. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm not married anymore. This is my dream job. I'm the guy that, uh, that caught up with the bus or caught up with the car. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't know. Barking dogs, the dogs don't bark at uh, parked cars. So I plan to keep moving. <laughs> Uh, over here, so why don't you wait for a mic? It'll be easier. Stage has a mic. Yeah. And it would be good for the mayor if you told them who you were. Uh, Susan Collett, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. Yeah. Appreciate all of your optimism tonight. I think it's really well received. So what optimism might you have for Illinois and Chicago? Um, <laughs> my optimism is that... Um, they're going to deal with the problems because they're going to be forced to and they're going to be shamed into it. Um, Rahm, and, Rahm Emanuel and I are really good friends. They've got really tough politics over there. But um, I think that Illinois and Chicago are going to decide uh, to do what is required. They're just in really, really tough political environments. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I'm here tonight. My job tonight in my own small way is to show that there is a path to taking on these problems and winning and not losing, which is why I think that people are shrinking from me. So beyond Chicago and Illinois, we all in this room know uh, that our pension challenges are $200 billion municipally and a trillion at stake. But you all in your space have to be able to reference someone that took on a challenge because the way to persuade a politician to do something is to tell them how they're not going to get beat. So the same way that you all wanted to be in the financial services space or in academia all of your lives, I wanted to be mayor all of mine. So when you walk in my office, you need to know how to tell me to do something hard and survive it. You know, Rom and I had a robust debate. Rom did school reform while I did pension reform. And he spent a massive amount of political capital on school reform. And so we go back and forth about whether I made the call or he made the call, right call. We both got reelected. I got reelected with 84%. <laughs> so, um, but I think that, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we're just going to have to shame folks into action and be there to help people and encourage folks who want to take it on. I think Illinois is going to get it right, and I think Chicago is going to get it right because Chicago is just flat out one of the best cities in the world. And somebody's going to get in a room and say that we can't continue to have this albatross hanging around a city that everybody believes is one of the best cities in the world. It is breathtaking. And I think that that's kind of the more compelling argument. That's how I think you all are going to get there. And if you don't, um, if you don't, this, you know, all of that success is just going to be squandered. I don't believe they're going to allow that. Okay. Uh, I'm Josh Kottbaum. I'm from Brookings, but I'm also on the board of Pulte, as it happens. Yeah. Um, it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the relationship between cities and states. Yes. And how you, in a, in a city with one politics and a state with different politics, mm -hmm. how do you handle that? How do you get compromises? How do you get deals? How do you make that work? I think that you have to spend an enormous amount of personal time um, when you're in a city like mine with, Repu with the Republicans that have almost constitutional majorities. And so I spend an enormous amount of personal time 
and I spend a lot of time with business leaders that have relationships that I don't have and that make a compelling case that it's in all of our selfish interests for the city of Atlanta to thrive. So whatever cheap political points you want to make off of Atlanta are not worth what we lose in the grand scheme of things. And then I had a really terrific partner in the form of Governor Nathan Deal. And we agreed that we were going to work together on the 20% of things that we agreed on, which in politics really gives you an enormous amount of space. And so we both got our jobs in a ditch. We were both elected around 2010 and 2011 with 10.5% unemployment. And so it really allowed us to decide that we were going to change this together. And then we've been through a number of hard situations together and neither of us have thrown the other under the bus. The other thing is because I came up in the General Assembly, um, you might make a, a governor look bad one day, but boy, he can make you look bad the other 364. <laughs> and so because I came up in the General Assembly, I always understood that a city is just the notion of a governor. And so I kind of run my politics that way. But I think that you know when you're helping people, you gotta be at this stuff. Legislative and state politics are slow and methodical and you have to have trust and you have to be able to maintain confidentiality and you can't get baited by the press into trying to knock the crap out of the other party. That is a loser's game long term if you run a city. My job is to make the city of Atlanta as successful as possible. And while I maintain my political core, there are about 20% of things that I agree with on with, with Republicans that we work on about as well as I've seen a Republican governor and a Democrat mayor work on. And I think that the country needs that. And I think that's why Atlanta and Georgia is being rewarded for it. When the governor and I are recruiting a business or a company, it's seamless. So the city is not broke, so we put up our incentives. And the governor can have his meeting and know that Atlanta's going to be a strong partner. And when he and I walk in the rooms together, I can tell you, uh, we went to meet with the secretary of transportation one time and almost got his poor secretary fired because we were trying to get the port of Savannah deepened. And at that time, President Obama was president. And so we were going to see the secretary of transportation, Ray LaHood. And when we showed up at the same time, the poor lady thought that she had a mix-up <laughs> and had gotten, <laughs> and so it ended up, you know, working out. But I was just giving you a kind of sense of how rare it is for, for what we do. We need more of that. We need more of that. 20% can get you a lot. Uh, woman here and then the guy in the back. Oh. You mentioned a lot of people. Tell us who you are. I'm Amanda Beck from Georgetown University. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that a lot of people are moving back into cities. I think especially a lot of the younger generation are, are um, wanting to move back into cities. And other than jobs um, and industry, what do you think are the most important investments by a city to make um, to really attract that growth and people moving back into a city? Public safety. Um, as I said, crime in Atlanta is down 37 points. Uh, we've had less than 100, year, 100 murders every year except for one. We went above 100 uh, last year. We will be below 100, uh, knock on wood, this year. Uh, but I think public safety, people look for fundamentals. And so um, cities all over the world are thriving, but if you get public safety right, job creation right, amenities right, uh, best in class experience, right? Um, I think that uh, cities are going to dominate uh, for the next hundred years. This is going to be the century of cities in my mind. The Atlanta Belt Line, uh, the capability to walk through 45 neighborhoods without getting in a car. And Atlanta was a very car centric town. Um, green space. Atlanta doesn't have an ocean or a beach. But we've got one of the most beautiful tree canopies uh, in the world. So every part of the city feels like a park in its own way. 
And then I think our real secret sauce is um, Atlanta is a city where you can bring and build your dreams. So it, it, it just does not have a very rigid social order. You really can come to Atlanta and be a part of whatever you want. And so um, that's why I think that uh, if it's the South, it's us right now. If you just go back three or four years, every time people mentioned Atlanta, they mentioned Charlotte. Mm -hmm. I don't, you don't really hear that right now. <laughs> <laughs> George? Yeah, George Friedlander, Court Street Group. Um, clearly, Atlanta has become, and, and you from what you described on, on um, climate change and sustainability and so on, you become a leader in, in what is euphemistically called smart cities. Um, how do you manage your technology footprint? Do you have a, a chief technology officer? Do you work closely with, with Georgia Tech? Um, do you work closely with, with tech companies that are partners? Uh, what, what, what's the formula for, for, for Atlanta specifically? First thing was to, to get uh, a real uh, cutting edge technology individual. The guy that we have um, used to work for uh, MGM Gaming and decided that he wanted to do something different with his life. So he was a high charging private sector individual and we lucked up and he had a conscious moment, I don't know what it is, but I offered him a job immediately. And so he decided that he wanted to take that skill set and apply it to a city. That attracted other people in that space. We brought Georgia Tech into the heart of the city, so we're constantly partnering with Georgia Tech, which is one of the, the best uh, schools uh, in the country in that space. We brought them across 7585. They used to be on the other side of the highway. They're now in the main part of the city. And then uh, within the last three weeks, the Centers for Disease Control, Emory University, and the Children's Hospital all made the decision to annex into Atlanta. And so any given day, we've got a network of about a quarter of a million students. Georgia State University, the biggest public college in the state of Georgia. So all of that is really creating this stickiness, and you really be able to get a very good buy uh, on a person that cares about smart cities and sustainability. And then I'm all in on it. And so um, you're, you know that when you have a leader that's all in and you have the financial resources to support talented people, you just got to get out of the way. And when people are an impediment to it, you've got to back them up. And so I can give you metric after metric where we're leading to the point where uh, when Michael Bloomberg was looking for a mayor to appoint to the board of the Global Covenant, I'm the only U.S. mayor on that board. And I think it's because of what we have done. In the last tranche of Rockefeller Resilient Cities, the city of Atlanta was selected as one of the cities to join the 100 res resilient cities around the world. There's also a huge smart city component to that. And so um, I just think that people want to be around folks that execute and win. And I really believe in the sustainability initiative. I really think that there's something bad going on with the planet and we've got to figure out how to cool it, and we've got to cut out all of this political stuff, and let's just talk about making the weather better than it is and making it cooler, um, because something's going on. And I believe that in my gut. And so in my, in my deal, uh, when I believe in it, we get to do it until the last minute of the last day or the last hour that I'm in office. And there's all of this talent that's out here that's looking for cities to partner with. And so it's just like a meeting like this. I bet that I will get three consequential references by being with you all tonight that will make Atlanta better. So this morning when I started my cabinet, there was a guy who um, went on a trip to Ben Gurion Airport um, that, that was exposed to a malware defense through that visit that we're now using at Hartsfield Jackson. So Conversations like this and being exposed to the best is how you have the best around you. Look back one more or two more. Uh, start back there and then Natalie in the front. Vivian, could you bring the mic to Natalie here? I'm Mike Stanton with Build America Mutual. More importantly, I'm a Mets fan. Yes. Two point, two part question. A, would you agree that it's a travesty that the Braves walked away from a 20-year-old baseball stadium yeah. to move out of the city of Atlanta? Yeah. 
MB, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between sports teams and cities and, and the power dynamics there? Happily. I mean, I think the Braves are owned by Liberty Media. Ted Turner never would have made that decision. They made a business decision. You know, we had a beautiful Ford Explorer, and somebody walked up and offered them a Range Rover with rims and shiny paint <laughs> for $400 million. I mean, the taxpayers in Cobb raised five taxes to pay $400 million to build a stadium that's closer to my house than the old stadium was. So let me just unpack this. Let me be real clear. If the Atlanta Braves were moving to Nashville, I would have spent whatever it took. They weren't moving to Nashville, they were moving to Cobb County. So for me, that was like the San Francisco 49ers playing in Claremont or the Dallas Cowboys playing in Irving. My ego is not that big. <laughs> the other thing that they wanted me to do was they wanted me to put a quarter of a billion dollars on a credit card. If I had made that deal, I wouldn't be giving a talk to a group of financial professionals tonight. <laughs> It was a terrible financial deal. <laughs> you look at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium deal, that's a $1.5 billion building in the heart of our city, and our convention sector is a $15 billion sector that employs 300,000 people. And I couldn't have a massive hole in my downtown. The second point is, is that building, uh, our exposure is $200 million paid by hotel motel tax. So it's 85% of guests who come to Atlanta. The third point is we make money off of that. So we make eight to 10 million a year off that hotel motel tax that goes to police and firefighters. This is a tax so you impose to pay for the exactly. Falcon it's, Stadium. It's a tax that the General Assembly imposed. So once again, it's a revenue stream that if we hadn't had the Falcons playing in that building, it would have what? Gone away. As it relates to the Phillips Arena, uh, our basketball arena, I did that deal, but we own that building. So I'm not giving a building to a billionaire, I'm maintaining a tenant in downtown Atlanta for 30 years. The second part of that story is we now have a $1 billion development that's going in 200 yards away. So on the football deal and on the Phillips Arena deal, I believe everyone in, those, in, the, in this room would have done those deals. On the Braves deal, I don't think anyone in this room would have done those deals. And I just go to the politics of it. The guy that made the decision to do that Braves deal lost. He's a good man, a man named Tim Lee. He called that play and he's no longer chairman of Cobb County. And so it goes to this notion of, when I did the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, I did it before my election. Right? I remember telling people, I'm the referendum. We're not going to have a referendum. I believe that we should build a stadium. This is the financial model. And if you're that dissatisfied, it's an election in November. That's kind of my math on it. Natalie? So I'm, I'm glad you got to the stadium question. Um, Identify yourself. Uh, Natalie Cohen. I'm head of municipal research at Wells Fargo Security. Yeah. Um, you're our banker. Oh, Atlanta. good. Glad to, Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. got about <laughs> a billion or so, two billion of our great. operating That's dollars. great. That's great. Um, so back to the climate issue. Um, what's exciting is after our president pulled out of the Paris Accord, the cities got together, and you mentioned Mayor Bloomberg's initiative. Mm -hmm. So can you clock that forward? Is this an enduring alliance where the cities and maybe a couple of states are now saying, we're going to do this, we can do this, we're going to keep going in this direction of worrying about the climate, doing, taking initiatives to change it, and so on. Is it five years out, ten years out? Is this an enduring alliance? It is an enduring today? alliance, and it is right now. In the U.S., more than 330 mayors signed on to honor the Paris Accord in Miami at the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting. Uh, I am highly confident that because cities are becoming more aggressive, we can still get to 30 to 35 percent reductions, right around 40 if we really reach. And that's the period until our national government breaks this fever, uh, in my opinion, by not acknowledging what's going on around climate. But every mayor I know um, is moving more aggressively than they ever have before 
and like I say everywhere I travel around the country, to do a deal with the city of Atlanta, you need eight council votes and me. And you're engaged in a practice that is at the center of the ninth largest economy in the United States. I believe that scales really nicely for the business community. So if you look at the 75 major metros in the United States of America, you're looking at 80% of population and 75% of GDP. So I think that that is a really nice model for the business sector. Uh, rather than pounding your head uh, at the national government level, I think that people are going to make the decision to engage mayors uh, in a pretty decisive fashion, and I see no end to it. That's why I think that this is going to be the century of cities. Thank you. Uh, before we end, I just want to remind people that we'll have breakfast at Brookings beginning at 745, and we'll begin the first panel, the, at, uh, the first sessions at 830 tomorrow morning at Brookings. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we break, please join me in thanking Mayor Reed for being so inspirational. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.